I'm going to kind of unpack specifically the resources that the film shares out at the end. Um, that's going to be the bulk of my section. It's my entire section, if I'm being very honest. Uh, I just like was like, how cool mm -hmm. that the film at the end, you get in the last credits and it's like, go here to learn more. And I'm like, you got it. <laughs> That's exactly what we're about. Yeah. And I was just like, what a wonderful way to use one, like this movie that like a lot of people went to go see in theaters. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it mm -hmm. was the name itself did a lot of the work for, but what, I will say like some of the resources I did notice, like didn't have a lot of views on YouTube. Like that makes me mad. So I actually yeah. want to highlight them because it is something that was like at the last little section of the movie that if like you left right away or you just like were on your phone because you're like the movie's done. Uh, or or you just like weren't mm -hmm. looking up at the right time it's only there for a few seconds so I thought like what a better way to cover what this film was trying to do by highlighting the resources the film provides so I'm gonna get into it so essentially as Gabe gave our whole overview of Nia DaCosta's Candyman 2021 but it does something that we love to see uh and it gives viewers next steps as well as just like a really interesting website that uh, had like a ton of resources, highlighted artists, creatives, advocates, and like the impact that they're making. Um, in the closing credits, in case you missed it, uh, they provide a link and the link is candymanmovie.com slash impact. And in that link, you find like just a lot of resources. There's a wonderful, the YouTube video that Gabe mentioned that I just so highly recommend because it just was, as, an, as I said, I love context. The more context I have, the better. And it just gave a little extra context that I just thought was really great. It's also just like people talking about it in a way that was like really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and highly recommend that. But uh, essentially, when you do go into this link, you find an array of information all relevant to the film as well as history. And it's something that, you know, I didn't want people to miss. They didn't want you to miss. Because as they say throughout the entire thing, uh, tell everyone. That's mm -hmm. what they want the audience to do. They want people to talk about Candyman. So um, also I will say something that is always important, I think, when discussing these kinds of things, if you don't want to hear me say stuff about it, that's yeah. totally, the, the resources there, we're going to link it in the blog. Um, I'm also going to highlight it on screen. If you want to mute me and just read it, go for it. Like, honestly, I don't, I am going to read a lot of just the words from it. So if you don't want to hear me say it, that's totally good. Um, mm -hmm. And if you want to hear other people talk that are not me, um, the Impact of Black Horror video is great. Totally recommend. Um, it just kind of unpacks Candyman more, the story, the legend, as well as like the general generational trauma that influenced the film and the impact everything all has. So like they really get into it. And honestly, it's a really great resource to watch and listen to if you don't want to. If you want to listen to me, but you also don't want to be listening to me, go do both. <laughs> um, so essentially, I just really appreciated that the film, in collaboration with like so many nonprofit organizations, leaders, experts, and advocates, gave the audience such clear and intentional next steps. I think that's something like, as the ghouls, we just always love to see because that's what we try to do within our platform is like, we watch this film, here are things that you can do. If it's work, have learned something heavy, like these are your next steps. And it did that work for us, which is just like lovely. Um, so first I'll unpack the official companion guide. Uh, I actually have it here. So fancy. Mm. Um, and essentially I'm just going to go through each resource. If you would just like to read it, I say go for it. But essentially in this uh, companion guide, they just go through a lot of really great information. Um, they go over it as a way to help audiences go deeper into the themes of Candyman and that Monkey Paws production and Universal Pictures collaborated with the Langston League, an educational curriculum firm that specializes in culturally responsive instruction materials to create the official, you know, companion guide uh, and exploration of themes. With special insight from educators, Professor Tana Nareev Du and Professor John Jennings, this tool helps fans explore the legend of Candyman and Black culture. Um, the guide opens up with a statement that reinforces why I chose to highlight it during my section, and it gives the instruction to tell everyone. It says, this guide is a tool of your own making. Do with it as you wish, quote it, debate it, 
highlight it, write in it, devour the resources. The guide grants you access to the innermost thoughts of educators of Black history, genre experts, and horror, the horror obsessed. We've immersed ourselves in the reclamation of Candyman, and we have quite a lot to say. Tell everyone. Um, and they sign it off the links. Um, and there's a few sections within this. Uh, if we have time, I'll go through all of them. If we don't, then I'll get you through as much as I can and then encourage you to do, you know, reading on your own. But um, the curriculum throughout is created in collaboration, as I said, with the Langston League, an organization that operates as a multi-consultant curriculum firm that specializes in designing culturally re relevant instructional material at the intersection of Black history and pop culture for multi-generational students. Um, and essentially, this is where I divert a little bit from the uh, guide because I like went off and I looked at all the organizations that they reference uh, and give just like a little extra context for them. So on their website, they offered a few other companion guides for the films. Uh, they have one for Lovecraft Country. They have one for something called The Big Payback and a project called Wakanda Unscripted, which is a free two-part guide for Black and Latinx curriculum designers exploring STEM connections to Marvel's Black Panther franchise. Um, as a newer organization, they started these collaborations in 2016, and their website has links to other resources like, uh, for example, their YouTube channel uh, that's educational entitled Decolonized, uh, and it is a YouTube series featuring history instruction designed to be a flexible resources for aspiring and current late elementary and middle school grade students. Um, Decolonize provides students, families, and stakeholders with various strategies for closely examining, questioning, and analyzing primary sources. So if you go into the uh, little link that I provide in the blog, they have a whole overview of like a curriculum that any educator could use if they would like to. Um, it was free and on there. Uh, so it seems like they're doing a lot of work just to like further information and educational resources and in their collaboration with Monkey Paul Productions and uh, Nia DaCosta in Candyman, uh, they've created something really cool. Um, so to get back to the curriculum, uh, the guide itself opens up with a foreword by Professor Tata Nareev Du, uh, who is an American author, executive producer of Horror Noir, a history of Black horror at UCLA, and a lecturer. Uh, she is best known for the film historian and expertise in Black horror, uh, and Nia DaCosta's Candyman could be titled, uh, as they say in this, uh, Candyman Reclamation. They say a reclamation of our story, a reclamation of our history, a reclamation of our trauma, and in, in adapting Clive Barker's short story, The Forbidden, which takes place in Liverpool as an examination of urban myths and classism, 1992's Candyman transplanted the story to a struggling community in the United States, specifically Chicago's Cabrini Green Housing Project. DaCosta's Candyman is a genuinely terrifying film that both asks and answers questions such as what is the impact of generational and community trauma? What is the relationship between art and trauma? What haunting, hauntings result when an entire community becomes a ghost? And how do you depict Black fears without re-traumatizing audiences or creating fear of Blackness? Um, some of these questions are actually answered in the video that I mentioned before, if you do want to ever check that out. Uh, and it's just like a really interesting conversation. So uh, after the foreword, we get uh, the first section of the guide that's titled Section 1, Myth and Folklore. And this stretches from pages 10 to 18. They go through uh, kind of like why and like how the story is established and like why it was so important to like restage it and retell it uh, from this lens. So at the beginning of the film, Troy Carthright sets the stage in a way the diaspora is used to. In a moment of collectivism surrounded by a family and friends, he encircles the group to tell the tale of, the grad, of a grad student doing anthropological work around Chicago's Caprini Green Housing Project. He is passing down a story to unknown, unknowing peers, a practice bestowed upon us through uh, Monde Empire in Mali and Africa and beyond. At first, it appears that Troy is Candyman's griot, a storyteller or oral historian that preserves our stories like traditions and traditions. By candlelight, he weaves the myth of Helen Lyle, a woman said to have snapped and taken several black lives and a Rottweiler uh, 
As we resume the film, we realize that Troy is a participant in a game of telephone, mistakenly identifying Helen as a serial killer in an urban legend of Candyman. The story's griot is, is truly William Burke, as played by Coleman Domingo, a connoisseur of the spin cycle at the laundromat, what feels like a metaphor for Candyman's iterations and generational trauma. William's exposure to Candyman's legacy at an early age establishes an understanding of the stories need to be told. We realize that Candyman isn't just an urban legend, but a warning to be taken seriously, a culmination of real tragedies that have happened throughout Candyman's Cabrini Green history, stories that would go untold without generations remembering to tell everyone. Candyman is how we deal with the fact that these things happened and they are still happening. Um, with the intention of preserving all the original messages and to avoid a kind of telephone whisper down the lane situation, that's why I'm really just reading from what is being said. I don't want to misquote anybody. I don't want to say the wrong thing because I recognize that my lens is not the lens that needs to be telling the story. Um, so essentially, I'm doing a lot of direct quotes and I highly recommend reading it yourself. Um, the guy continues on with Zora Neale Hurston uh, in Troy Carthright's recounting of Helen Lyle's demise. He notes that she came to Cabrini Green asking questions and taking pictures of graffiti and people. Lyle's work noted here in the original movie is very much like the three-walled room that author and anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston speaks of. Hurston defines many Black American spaces as rooms with one wall missing, exposing their lives to the white man's intentions and inspection. Um, in February of 1927, Hurston made her way to the Gulf states to preserve our stories through community griots. With a pistol in tow and a car named Sassy Susie, Hurston navigated the Jim Crow South, collecting the songs, stories, dances, and traditions of Black people. Hurston's work began in Eastonville, Florida, a self-governed Black town from which she hailed. And she described Eatonville as a four-walled room, a space mostly bereft of outside interference. Antithesis of Helen Lyle, Hurston's preserving of our stories exemplified our self-determination, centering our full selves dialect, folklore, collectivism, and all. Works such as Barakun and Every Tongue's Got to Confess are living legacies to this work. Uh, and that's a direct organization of quote from the Langston League. Um, the guy continues and highlights work from W. E.B. Du Bois in a recorded autobiography and his reflection on the disturbing acts of violence that were inflict inflicted upon a real black man named Sam Haas. Um, du Bois' recollection of this experience in the market highlighted within the above linked audio clip, the guide says shows us that Candyman's original story, which also involves a lynching and severing of an arm, is a real American horror story. So as much as as Gabe was saying, the things showed in like the puppet shows and the lore used throughout the story are based on real things that happened. Um, and the using the art to continue to just acknowledge that it happened, as they said, say their names and acknowledge that like lots of horrible things have happened. Um, so the guy goes on to highlight a nonprofit organization uh, called the Confess Project that aims to support mental health in black men and boys using a barbershop as a resource and setting. Um, in my blog, I do link this, and if you do download the guide, there is a link at the bottom of the overview of what the Confess Project does. But they're doing really amazing work, specifically using barbershops as a place to distribute therapy resources. Uh, um, they go on to say that barbershops are pertinent to Black communities and are often a space of lively social interactions, storytelling, and healing camaraderie. Having conversations while grooming brings calmness to many in which barbers are centered as healers too. The Confess Project Co Coalition exemplifies this cultural tradition with this mission. Uh, and the Confess Project is committed to building a mental health culture for boys, men of color, and their families through the capacity building, advocacy, organizing, and movement building. We believe in a world without barriers to stigma and shame. The organization prides itself on being an America's first mental health barbershop movement uh, in which they offer to train those interested in becoming barbers and equip them with the necessary tools related to mental health advocacy. In addition, barbers are taught the importance of active listening, positive communication, validation, and how to reduce mental health stigma when servicing and interacting with clients. Uh, on their website, they have linked resources that I'll also highlight here. 
uh, within the blog for uh, mental health services that are kind of like more inclusive, uh, specifically not just focusing on black men, but also uh, black women, LGBTQIA individuals, uh, the National Queer and Trans Therapists of Color Network, uh, as well as many others and just resources that exist. So I have linked that in our blog if you're interested. Um, and as it continues, the Langston League and Companion Guide interviews the Confess Project's founder. They're also actually in the video that we mentioned before uh, and speak uh, about Candyman. And I'm not gonna read the entire interview, but there's one point where in interviewing Lorenzo Lewis, they discuss the future goals of the organization and uh, as a direct quote, they say in the next three years, our goal is to train 5,000 barbers. And at the end of this year, we would have trained a thousand. Right now we're pushing the road to 1 million campaign and we're in partnership with Gillette. We want to reach a million people by the end of December, 2021, because oh, I'll, I'll need to find out if they did, because uh, that's, that's a past quote. But uh, with a thousand barbers, each of those barbers can reach up to a hundred clients per month. Our goal is to reach people through the training of advocacy conversations and the dialogue in the barber's chair. We've also been able to partner with Harvard University and have done research with them over the last year to show how barbers are becoming mental health gatekeepers, especially in this racial distrust era of COVID-19. Um, they close out the section uh, of this campaign, of the section of the companion guide with a prompt and space to write, which was really cool. Um, they give like an overview of the terms that they've mentioned throughout so that you have like definitions to go off of. And they also offer you a space and a prompt uh, to write out words, stories, phrases, myths, legends, griots, a whole meaning to the viewer. So if you want to experience this guide in earnest, you can download it at the link that we provide. Um, and also it's just like cool that you get like kind of like unstructured homework, like it is structured, but like, you know, it's self-driven and it gives you a space like to record what means something to you, which uh, as the entire point of the story of Candyman is like to preserve legacies and like speak on the things that matter to you. So they give you a space, two whole pages, three whole pages, no, two. So you get two pages where you can just like write what out what's important to you. And that's pretty cool. Um, in section two, exploring gentrification and Candyman and beyond, uh, they provide uh, an image that is important to the, what I'm going to say next uh, and kind of go through gentrification and displacement. So they say a few years ago, the Langston League held a workshop in a neighborhood that had very few Black residents. The school was emphatic about the urgency of teaching decolonized Black history to their students. After discussing ways to surface history in their area with students, a teacher raised her hand and said, this is a historically white neighborhood. We would have difficulty finding Black history here. On our way to the school, we noticed an African Methodist Episcopal Church a few blocks away. The church was established in the 1800s. Based on several of our his history research trips, we know that where there is an AME church, there are Black people and Black history. The presence of Black churches has always been evidence of our roots in a community. And uh, the hand in this picture, their name is Anthony. Uh, Anthony holds up an outdated image of the Missionary Baptist Church in Cabrini Green. The mural once painted above is the door depicts imagery of diverse peoples alongside names of figures who are synonymous with tragedy and triumph. Uh, Malcolm X, Anne Frank, Dr. King, and more. The mural was painted in 1972 by a prominent Black muralist and Ch Chicagoian named William Walker. It was a piece herald heralded up until its very last moment when preservationists discovered it had been whitewashed by painters. The church's whitewashing feels like a metaphor for our continued displacement at the hands of urban renewal, development, induced displacement, and gentrification. It is a reminder of our continued erasure despite mounting evidence that we have always been here and always will be. And they continue, they basically say, uh, Little Hell, Smoky Hollow, Combat Alley, Cabrini Green, helping us save her save or keeping us inside keeping us safe or keeping us inside i can't read today and it's fine um they go on uh to highlight a chicago-based artist and that's something that they do on their website that's just like really cool they highlight a ton of artists on their website so if you're looking for like cool art it is on there um as well as like they highlight a lot of real artists within the film that i'm also going to get into but um in this section they highlight a chicago-based artist 
being phenom and he calls Cabrini green homes the greens. The metaphor isn't lost on us as he describes how each distinct neighborhood on Cabrini Green's map takes its own shape and assists or hinders its residents growth. Phenom describes the communities different from the gl glimpse we see in Candyman. Uh, in the following quote. So he says, as a kid in Cabrini Green, you're not focused on the violence. We saw grandmothers, aunties, people getting in motion to head to the grocery store to celebrate holidays. Everybody was living and ready for the feast. When it was good, it was really good. And when it was bad, it was really bad. Phenom then emphasizes that while some days were tough, even remembering a Halloween moment with the parents fearing razor blades and trick-or-treat candy, the fear fueled the community's defense. As a result, families became overprotective, rummaging through candy bags and ensuring kids traveled in herds and made them closer. Everything, as he goes on to say, everything was in four black block radius. My school, my church, my girlfriend, my best friend, my grandparents on both sides, and my aunties and uncles. Phenom describes a daily routine, bouncing from house to house, collectivism, and a care all around him and others. He says that his favorite memory is his uncle, who may many respected and feared uh, throughout the neighborhoods, uh, an uncle who would stop to wipe his nose if he thought it was runny. He was presumably a good man and a big dude. He had a soft side, so that's important too. Uh, and Phenom continues to say, uh, he channels the community care he felt in Cabrini Green and his work as an MC, educator, poet, and leader. A major part of Phenom's life work is a Chicago-based organization he founded for young MCs, aptly named MC School. Uh, MC School's objective is to develop a social creative arts initiative designed to strengthen young teaching artists in the fundamentals of becoming sustainable and impactful assets in their community and family via organizing through the arts. In addition, MC School serves as a restorative justice and violence prevention strategy. As it continues on, we get actually some history of Cabrini Green, which I, I honestly didn't know a lot of this stuff, so I thought it was really interesting. Uh, they kind of go, it's like little tiny bits of information, but you know, it's still context that I didn't have before. So uh, they say in the 1850s, the area acquires nicknames such as Little Hell and Smoky Hollow because of the factories established there that were often surrounded by flames or smoke. By the 1890s, the area becomes known as Little Sicily due to a large population of Italian immigrants. The 1940s, the Francis Cabrini houses were built. They are row homes with 584 units and 54 buildings. By the 1950s, the Cabrini Green extension is built, made up of red brick mid-high rises with 1925, I can't say numbers, 1925 units and 15 buildings. By 1960, the William Green homes were built in 1962. There were 1,096 units. The lawsuit, uh, Gretro et al. versus Chicago Housing Authority is filed, stating that CHA's public housing program was racially segregated. Um, by the 1990s, Cabrini Green begins a plan to demolish standing spaces and replace them with mixed income communities. The first Candyman is filmed in the towers. Uh, and then 2021, the new Candyman is in theaters, having been delayed because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and it features former Cabrini Green homes. As they continue to go on, this is where it starts to get just like super interesting. It was already interesting, but then like they really get into like historical stuff that I just thought was really cool. Um, so the word is, the world is familiar with Lorraine Hansberry's work and leg legacy, especially her play, A Raisin in the Sun. However, many people don't know that the play, named after the line of the Langston Hughes, A Dream Deferred poem, was inspired by her parents' fight against Chicago's discriminatory housing practices. Um, in 1937, while most Black Chicago residents were restricted to Chicago's Black Belt due to the racially restrictive covenants, Hansberry's father purchased a home in and then all white area of Chicago called Woodlawn. After his purchase, white residents took the Hansberry family to court, demanding their departure from the neighborhood. Despite this, the Hansberry family stood their ground and continued to stay in the house during attacks on their home and property. In addition, Carl Hansberry patrolled the home at night with a loaded handgun to keep his family safe. The Hansberry v. Lee court case made it all the way to the United States Supreme Court, where the court ruled in favor of the Hansberry family. The prosecution did not have the 95% of the required signatures to enforce a racially restrictive covenant. 
while the court case didn't change discriminatory practices for the nation, it showed many that it would one day be possible to end legal housing segregation. Um, and as it, it's just, I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to start to rush through this, but uh, it continues on and we get more from uh, specifically uh, Ida B. Wells and the thing that's highlighted right in the corner is white people built the ghetto and then erased it when they realized they built the ghetto. Uh, so a lot of uh, what we see happen is that there's a lot of erasure that takes place throughout history, specifically of white people trying to erase the bad things that they've done. Um, so they go on to say Nia DaCosta's Candyman helps us reconsider what urban renewal and redevelopment really have to offer black communities everywhere, especially when considering black residents in Chicago. When we think of the original candy man, Daniel Robitaille's story, we are reminded by William that before the creation uh, and demolition of the Cabrini Green housing projects, Robitaille's murder and execution took place upon the same grounds where the high rises once stood, a site of trauma constantly built on and built over under the guise of redevelopment. Um, for example, look at the, the Ida B. Wells Holmes name named after the Mississippi-born investigative journalist and freedom fighter herself. Wells spent her life speaking out against the injustices of Black people throughout her writing, focusing on the horrors of lynching in the American South through their anti-lynching campaign. Following the death of her friend, Thomas Moss, Wells became interested in the, ta the tactic of white mob violence and the use of lynching as a tool of terrorism and intimidation. And in 1892, she published her pamphlet, Southern Horrors, Lynch law and all of its phases, which resulted in the destruction of her printing press in Memphis and her eventual relocation to Chicago, where she would remain until her death in 1931. About eight years after Wells' death, the Ida B. Wells home or Wells, Wells town, town, Wells town uh, were created in response to years of protests and campaigns for affordable housing in Chicago's Bronzeville neighborhood. Unfortunately, the start of the 1980s, the Ida B. Wells home became susceptible to negligence from the housing authorities. Uh, intercommunal violence and poli policies enforced to create vacant properties, a fate that would befall many area housing projects, including Cabrini Green. If we think of ghosts of the past as site specific, as Professor John Jennings would say, then it forces us to reconsider those whose shoulders are, are we standing on? And in the case of Candyman, how literal or figurative might this question be? Um, I will say I'll end my exploration of this there because we are basically out of time but if you want to keep going into the it goes into more history specifically about the history of black chicago uh it was apparently founded the first settler of chicago illinois was a black man that's something i didn't know um uh, his name was jean baptiste pont du sable uh and was founder of a trading settlement landowner and immigrant from haiti so it kind of just gives you a bunch of like facts that are really cool <laughs> um and it just continues to outline and highlight nonprofit organizations and activists that are like actively doing work to bring positive change to the world. Uh, and also just like educate and spread awareness. Um, so the last one I'll mention is BEAM because that's the last one that I have. It's essentially Black Emotional and Mental Health Collective. A lot of these resources are centered around mental health, reasonably so, because a lot of existing in America is very traumatic, especially for BIPOC humans. So mental health resources are definitely a really great asset and something that they like highlight throughout um, the work. Uh, the last thing I recommend within the guide is to really focus in on the artists because the artists that are in the film are like real artists making really cool art in the world and the website and the guide highlights and gives names to each of them. So do recommend checking that out if you just want to know, like you saw the art and you're like, that was really cool. Like very genuinely, that is dope art. You want to know who made it? They really go through that for you, and you can find that in, in the blog. As that well. is so cool. It's great for like you know they're you know talking the talk, but they're walking the walk. Yeah, and I think that's so cool. <laughs> and like they have a huge platform, and they're using that platform for good. So like, it's dope. Yeah, I think um, it's it's such a interesting topic, like specifically of gentrification in horror. Like we've been seeing a lot of those commentaries coming through with, you know, Candyman, Vampires versus the Bronx. Yeah. You know, Attack the Block even. Um, barbarian 
we talked about that too. It's it's clearly something that people are struggling with and uh, upset about, and so um, it's it's really helpful to have this point of catharsis for like with the film, but then also then having like action items that follow it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, um, definitely let us know what you think about Candyman. Yeah. We uh, know that we know it was great <laughs> but i know some people who feel certain things i'd say definitely check out those videos if you were feeling any type of way about the film and just re-center yourself on, and think about what it is covering and that might help to better understand the film mm -hmm. and appreciate it on a different level um i do think it would be nice like you know we were, we were asking for like the the snyder cut of like a stupid film that we didn't need a Snyder cut of. I want to see like the DaCosta cut. Yeah. Of, <laughs> like I want an, the extended version where we actually get to sit with all these characters and uh, go through it. Cause I feel like there's some things missing. And so um, yeah, release the DaCosta cut. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here. We must, yeah. we must receive it. We must know. Um, that's funny. <laughs> and I, I'll say it one more time go read it yourself because like I'm not a great public speaker we do have a podcast I say words sometimes but I don't do it justice and I just think you really should read it yourself and it's good so last time I say it go read it <laughs> yeah you can find those resources yeah. on our in our blog and in our show notes I'll also link to some of the other reviews so you can do your own research as well just about um the folklore of Candyman and also some of the gentrification conversations that could be had so that you can do your own research and always keep going um yeah and and I would say look up uh movers and shakers community organizers in your own area to see how you can help combat uh, uh gentrification uh where you live yeah um yeah so yeah <laughs> so we're, we're in the midst of our horrors of society series is going to be like this um yeah. it's going to keep it's on going but it's all but good it's going to be society and we're doing it <laughs> society be society yep. <laughs> so uh don't get married with your kids okay. yeah i don't, I don't have a yeah i don't have any i don't want to say anything else <laughs>